Nick in Hampshire, Illinois. Hey, Rick. Hey, Nick. What's up? Oh, Mr. Tartman, Hartman, excuse me. Thank you for taking my call. I just wanted to ask you a few questions that maybe you could answer me about trade policy. Now, you've talked a lot. You're one of the only guys who will get out there and talk about our nation's trade policies. And I was wondering what we could do to encourage companies to move back to the United States while also keeping in place meaningful environmental regulations. Now, I only ask because one of the major influences of European countries coming back to the United States is because in the short term, our energy price, well, with the energy boom in places like North Dakota, our energy prices are going to be very low for the next few years. So um, how would you address something like that? We used to have uh, a trade policy, and by the way, this is the uh, the introduction in the first chapter of a book I wrote called "Rebooting the American Dream." And I'm not I'm saying that not to pitch the book because the book is online for free over at Truthout.org. It's also in bookstores, but you can read it for free at Truthout.org. Um, but uh, because all the documentation, all the footnotes, all the background of what I'm about to tell you is there, and so I, you know, therefore. Um, when George Washington became president of the United States, when he was literally standing out in his field and General Knox rode up to him and said, George, the Continental Congress just met. We are now a country, and you've been elected president. He, there were two things he wanted to do. One is he wanted to say goodbye to his mother, and, and she died just a few months later, so it was a good thing he said goodbye to her. And he knew she was dying. And the second was he wanted to get a, a suit of fine clothes made in the United States. Up until that point, the British had been practicing a, pr- a practice which they're very good at. This is, you know, Gandhi, the whole spinning wheel thing. This is the, the exact same thing. It was illegal to make fine clothing in the United States when the British occupied this country. You had to buy it from England. We would grow the cotton here. We would grow the wool here. You ship it to England. It was made into fine clothing. The fine clothing was sold back into the United States. There was a guy by the name of Daniel Hinsdale up in Connecticut who was running a bootleg fine clothing operation. And after the Revolutionary War, he kind of came out and started running a retail operation. He was the only guy in America who was making dress clothing that, uh, you know, where you could buy it. And General Washington sent General Knox up to Connecticut to, you know, gave him his measurements and said, go get me a suit that I can be sworn into in, in, you know, in, in with uh, wearing. And uh, Knox did that, and Washington was sworn in wearing a, a brown American-made suit. The, the portrait that was made of him the next day, he was wearing black English-made uh, formal wear, but he was actually wearing an American-made suit. He understood the importance of manufacturing. And so he went to Alexander Hamilton, his secretary of the, of the Treasury, and said, how do we create manufacturing here in the United States? Because if you don't create things, if you don't make things, you can't... I mean, this is, this is what Adam Smith referred to as the wealth of nations. Adam Smith, the example that he gave was, there's no inherent wealth or value in a stick laying on the ground, a tree limb. But if you carve it into an axe handle, if you apply human labor to it, it has a value, and that value can even be passed down from generation to generation. And so uh, Washington got this. And so in 1791, he became president. In 1793, Alexander Hamilton presented to, excuse me, in 1791, Hamilton presented to the Congress, he became president in 1789. In 1791, Hamilton presented to the Congress what was uh, titled Alexander Hamilton's 11-point report on manufacturers. And it was 11 specific things that America should do to become a great industrial nation. Washington endorsed this, and by 1793, virtually all of these had been made law. The most important ones were, number one, support to new and emerging and important industries. Today we would call this like subsidizing the solar industry, number one. Number two, uh, tariffs, trade tariffs. If you can make something, if you can make a pair of jeans in, or a, a pair of shoes, let's say, uh, that's the, which is the example actually that Hamilton used in one of his uh, commentaries on this. If you can make a pair of shoes in Connecticut with a dollar's worth of labor, and you can make that same pair of shoes in Mexico with 30 cents worth of labor, then when those shoes from Mexico hit the U.S. border, there should be a 70 cent tax on them. If you can make them for 10 cents worth of labor in China when they hit the U.S. border, there should be a 90 cent tax on them. So you have selective tariffs product by product, and there's over 22,000 tariff categories right now that the U.S. government holds, or the Department of Commerce holds, that so that no matter where you make something, it costs the same once it gets imported in the United States. 
That, that was put into place in 1793 by George Washington and stood until the Reagan administration. And that's why we used to make things in the United States. The average tariff from 1793 to 1980 was around 33, 34 percent. It got as high as 35, 36 percent during World War II. It had at various times been as low as 29 percent. But it was always in that range. The tariff, the average tariff, import tariff right now on U.S. on goods made overseas and brought in the United States is 2%. That's why companies are leaving the United States to manufacture things overseas. So I would just abandon all of these insane trade policies, and I would go back to what Alexander Hamilton proposed and George Washington put into place, and every president of the United States until Ronald Reagan supported and that is a tariff-based trade policy, which is, in effect, what is being done by China, South Korea, Japan, um, Taiwan, Germany, uh, much of the, many of the EU countries. They just do it with the value-added tax, which is, functions as a tariff, and that's a whole other rant. So I'm not so worried about enticing foreign corporations to invest in the United States. I'd like American corporations to start bringing their factories back to the United States, and if they're not willing to, you know, just get the hell out of business and let some other American entrepreneurs start making things in the United States. Nick, thanks a lot for the call. This is this is our trade policy. Is It's sick and it's broken. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. And this is also one of the reasons why you need to contact your member of Congress in the White House and say, no, we're not interested in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, otherwise known as the Southern Hemisphere Asian Trade Policy, SHAFTA.